you can find the start project on GitHub in the start folder. It's the number eight. This will give us a boilerplate to start implementing the grid. This will help us to get started faster. So the game again works that way. We have a grid, that's a tile map. Inside of it, we have a player. For now, the grid doesn't do anything. This is exactly what we had in the previous video. Let's head to the grid script and talk about what we'll make. This grid is going to manage everything that's inside of it. The player, but also the obstacles and potentially enemy AI or objects that you can collect. It has a few properties. We have to store the tile size, the half tile size, you'll see why. The grid size, the level will have some limits beyond which the characters won't be able to walk. Then you have the grid itself. It's going to be an array that we'll create in the ready function. And we'll also create some obstacles. We'll generate them procedurally for that video. Everything that's inside of it can move, but it's not going to move on its own. It's always going to ask the grid if it can move. The grid will handle everything that has to do with the grid. The player doesn't know anything about a grid whatsoever. So the player will just ask if a cell on the grid is vacant. And if so, it will request the grid to update its position. Let's initialize some values. We need to know how big the tiles are in our tile map, but also how big the grid is. So Godot calls tiles cells, and we can get the cell size with the method of the corresponding name. It's a method from the tile map class. It corresponds to the cell size. If you select the grid node, it's under the cell subcategory and it's the size here. That will just return this vector two. Then the half tile size is the tile size divided by two, nothing too fancy. And we'll use that to place the objects at the center of the cells because when we'll calculate the position of the characters on the grid, if we just multiply the tile size by the position on the grid, we'll get the top left corner of the tile. The grid size, it's just going to be a vector two, and we can decide anything we want, 16 by 16 cells. We also have a variable called obstacle that's going to store the obstacle scene. This one is just a sprite, if I go back in the hierarchy we'll use it to add obstacles to the grid. That's it. Now we first have to initialize the grid. And to do that, we have to create an array. A grid is just a two dimensional array. And in each of the cell, we can store something or have nothing. If there is something, we check the type of that thing. If it's an obstacle, for example, it means that you can't move to that cell. Here's how you create a grid, and that is useful in many games. We're going to use a range to represent a list of all the columns and then all the rows that our grid contains. So let's start with a for loop for x in the range, and that range will be the number of columns. The number of columns is the grid size.x. The range function will generate a list that contains 0, 1, 2, 3, and all that stuff up to the grid size.x minus 1 from 0 to 15. This gives us 16 iterations, and that's exactly what we need. We'll call the append function on the grid variable, and we'll just append an empty array. This empty array will correspond to the row, what we'll store in the next loop. This second loop has to be nested in the first one, so we create a row for each of the columns and effectively get a grid. But the principle is the same. We can copy the first line and we'll just change the x by y because now we are working on the other axis. So in that case, we will access the column using the x variable. And inside of that, we'll append nothing. We'll do that 16 times in that case because our grid has 16 rows. How about placing some obstacles on the grid so that we get some visual feedback on it? We're going to generate some sets of coordinates to place obstacles on the board. 
Let's add a local variable to store these positions. First of all, it will be an empty array to start with. We can use the range function again to create a set number of obstacles. For n in range, let's say five, we're going to create five obstacles. We can generate a set of coordinates. I'll call the local variable a grid position because that will be coordinates for the grid. And this has to be a vector two as we need both a X and Y coordinate. Now we'll generate some random numbers inside of it. To do that, we can use the rent I function. This creates a random integer that can be a huge value. It, it's any integer possible. It's going to be too big to fit the grid. However, with the module operator, we can get the reminder of the division by the grid size. Then our random number will fit the range between zero and the grid size. So, so let's use that modulo grid size dot X. This is essentially saying generate a very big number and then you make it at most as big as grid size dot X minus one. It's going to be between zero and 15. Now we need the Y coordinate as well. So we'll do the same, another random integer and grid size dot Y. Note that if the random function generates a random number, if you restart the game several times, the number will be the same because you have to modify a seed value. On the computer, random is not exactly random. It's actually complex calculations. As you're going to use the same seed value, if you don't change it every time, the result numbers will be the same every time as well. Now we want to store this position inside of the positions array. So let's use positions.append and we'll append the grid coordinates. That's it, because the generated coordinates are random, you can actually get the same value twice. If you generate a large number of objects on a small grid, the likelihood of something like that happening is even higher. So we must check if the position isn't already in the array. To do that, we can use the in keyword. If the grid position is not in the positions array, only then do we append the position. We can use a while loop to force Godot to generate five obstacles, but for this example, it's enough. It will work well. Now it's time to add our obstacles to the world to create them. We'll use a for loop again, and we'll just loop over all the positions that are in the positions array. Inside of that, let's create a new obstacle. We'll use the obstacle resource that we preloaded at the top of the script. Remember, it's just a scene with a sprite inside of it. We'll create a new instance of the obstacle object. That's how you can add something to the scene tree. You first have to create an instance of it to have an independent node. Then you can set its properties. And finally, you can use the add child method to add it as a child of the current node. Then we want to set its position to be in the corresponding position on the grid. To do that, we can use new obstacle dot set pose, just like with place a character. And to get this position, we want to convert the position on the grid to the world position in pixels. There's a method for that in the tilemap class. It's called map to world. It converts the coordinates from the map to the world. And we just need the grid coordinates. It's the position. Next up, we have to do something which is very important. We want to store that obstacle inside the grid array up there because it's this grid array that will use to know if the player has to collide with something or not. When there's only obstacles, we might not need to do that. But when you have other moving entities or when you have collectibles, for example, you want to know exactly what's on the cells next to the player. If it's something he can walk on and collect, for example, that's different from an obstacle that he will collide with. We have to store that in the array. To do that, we have to access the right row and column position inside of the array. So let's start with the X coordinate of our position and then the Y one. So starting with the columns and then the going down the rows. 
we can set that to whatever we want. We could use a string called obstacle. A good idea would be to add an enum at the top of the script. And let's add, you have the player, you have the obstacle, and um, maybe collectible, for instance. This enumeration is a good way to get auto-completion for um, things like a list of different flags or values that follow one another. So the enum is going to set the player constant to zero, obstacle constant to one, and collectible constant to two. This makes sure that you can't have two different constants that have the same value. So in the grid, we want to place an obstacle. And now if we try the game, you will see a little thing, a little error. You'll see that there's an invalid operands. We've been using a modular operation between an integer and a floating value. Even though we set our vector2 to store 16 and 16, these are stored as floating point values. So we have to use the integer function to convert them to a pure integer, 16, that's it. No decimals. Same thing for the grid size dot y. All right, so now we have our obstacles. And you can see there's something a bit strange about their position. There's one half cut on the left edge of the screen. I've added a grid visualizer node to help us with that. So get the grid visualizer script, drag it and drop it on top of it. It's just going to draw the grid on the screen so we can see what's happening. The obstacles are placed in the top left corner of the tiles. That is why I told you we needed that half tile size. We need to add it to the position that the map to world function returns. Let's add half tile size. And now you'll see that the obstacles are placed at the right position. 